gag order hearing in the trial of former Decatur police officer Mac Marquette uncovered some serious disciplinary conduct within the police department. City Council President Jacob Latner is proposing a plan to get some much needed answers. Our Kim McCoy has more. I mentioned in a council meeting uh, on the 21st that uh, it was on me now and I needed to, to step up and step in that void and, and if I if you didn't see any action from me hold me accountable. In the past eight months Decatur City Council meetings have allowed residents to voice one particular concern. I'm ashamed of it man. The, the way the police officers and the way they, they, they operate is ridiculous. Friday Decatur City Councilman Jacob Ladner announced a plan to address residents concerns and get some much needed answers. We would be uh, looking at hiring a third party uh, re independent review of our uh, police department kind of policies, procedures, practices, culture, um, kind of a comprehensive review. Uh, the intention is to have that on a city council agenda sometime uh, either in June or early July uh, to vote on. I asked Ladner the reason behind this proposal. I think it's uh, there's there's just questions that we want answers to and it's um, hard to to really figure out what's what's true, what's not. Um, and we really need clarity on, on what's going on, if there are issues we need to correct. So it's just a way, I think, for the public and, and us as, a, as leaders in the community to really get something that's uh, clear, factual, um, and something that'll help us uh, move forward. Ex-Huntsville Police Officer Tory Green of Green Research and Technology is the third party chosen for this review. The main thing that people said about Tory is he has high character, and that's the most important thing that uh, for me, when we hire somebody, is if, if it's constant feedback that they have high character, they have no agenda, you know, we're not trying to exonerate one person or prosecute another. We're, we, we want facts and we want clarity, and that's what Tory's going to do for us. Ladner also highlighted the neutrality aspect of this plan. This is this is a neutral a third party that's going to review things with no agenda and, and it's um, I think everybody wants that everybody wants to know from our police officers to our citizens everyday citizens to the folks that have been protesting we just want facts um, and clarity on kind of where are some areas that maybe we need to improve upon what are we doing well and that's what this will provide and, and really um, make it clear What's the state of the department? Um, are there changes that need to be made? And what are those changes? For Fox 54 News, I'm Ken McCoy. Decatur City Council held its regularly scheduled meeting tonight, but the big story is about what was not yet on the agenda. Last week's announcement by City Council President Jacob Ladner that there would be a third party review into the Decatur Police Department. It was seen as a major positive for all involved. It's a real step towards accountability and reform for the Decatur Police Department whose former officer, Mac Marquette, shot and killed Steve Perkins last September. But in order for this review to commence, a majority vote by the city council was needed. And although that a vote was not scheduled for tonight's agenda, it wasn't impossible that a vote could have been added later on. However, it was not added to tonight's schedule, so a vote was not held. But the public comment portion of tonight's meeting was entirely about the review. Local advocacy groups like Standing in Power and the Night Watch and other everyday members of the community, they were in attendance tonight. They and the council alike expressed support for the review and general appreciation for its inception, but questions came up over process, cost, and criteria. I have faith in the review process. I don't have faith in Decatur um, City. Uh, leadership at all, but I'm glad that they were open to a third party investigation. So while this third party review is going to get started, we have to be reactive to the things that we that we see coming out of the communication from the council with us, the communication with other people in the community about how they feel about the third party review and giving all our support and our weight behind that, but also putting our, our, our weight and our strength in numbers and everything else around the other things that we have going uh, in the city. For us, safety is taking accountability to know that you can't do your job and to get someone in the position that can. And so it's time for them to still take that step. That's a major step. Get out of your leadership role and give it to someone who can so we can feel safe at night and so we can get true justice for Steve. 
So when the review gets added to the agenda is still unknown at this point. I spoke with Decatur Mayor Tap Bowling, who left the meeting prior to the public uh, comment portion. He said he supports the review as a concept in general, but wasn't going to provide any further comment on any specifics. Now, the next two scheduled Decatur City Council meetings are Monday, June 10th and Monday, June 17th. So those are the two nearest dates that a vote could be had. At Decatur City Hall, Simon Williams, Fox 54 News. Happy Monday. Thanks for joining us. I'm Kenesha Dees. If you're looking for access to free fresh fruits and veggies, this is for you. Nearly three months ago, Alabama and m University and the Madison County Commission signed a five year agreement for a community garden. And now some of those crops are ready to be picked. Our Jasmine Bird takes us near Alabama and m on Meridian Street. We're growing a variety of crops in the gardens this year. Madison County Commission District 6 Harvest Associate Jason Andrus says currently. We have several different types of squash and green beans ready to harvest, uh, but soon we'll have other crops, uh, cucumbers, cantaloupe, honeydew, sweet corn, okra, purple hole peas, uh, and several others available. Madison County District 6 Commissioner Violet Edwards says the whole idea behind the community garden originally was twofold. To address the food scarcity within the District 6 and to be a research solution for Alabama A&M. And so there are a lot of communities in Alabama that don't have this. So to have this jewel right here in Madison County where people can come and to get this free food and to take advantage of this opportunity, it just makes it a special place. And on top of that, Commissioner Edwards says there's also more good news. Exciting news. So the next step is just our branding and our marketing. We're working with a team and very soon we hope to announce the new name along with signage and just watching it grow. It's an evolution, just a slow rollout and it is just exciting. Yay! <laughs> State Extension Specialist Clement Mensaw shares that his number one priority is assisting to protect these crops from insects and diseases. We have to monitor the insects. We have put some traps around to first, you know, find whether these insects are at a level that they can cause significant damage. We believe that the crops that we are growing are healthy for, for the community. In Huntsville, Jasmine Bird, Fox 54 News. For the city invited the Spanish-speaking community to its second-ever Hispanic-Latino Community Town Hall. It was a chance for folks to engage in meaningful dialogue with city leaders in English and Spanish. The community is looking for who they can trust, um, for information, for resources. There's a lot of things happening in this amazing city, um, but they don't know where to go. Marcos El Monte Perez is the president of the Huntsville Latino Advisory Council. He hopes events like these serve as the catalyst for communication between Spanish-speaking residents and the civil servants that work for them. We want to connect them to the right people and from there address some of the big needs like housing, education, transportation. And so if we can do that, then we'll go a long ways to helping them. This is just showing that city government is going out into the neighborhoods. We want to listen to people, find out what we're doing right and what we can do better. The meeting came about after an initial town hall in October showed further outreach with the Spanish-speaking community was necessary. At these meetings, you always come up with something that uh, maybe had not been on your radar. And so it's a great time to kind of do a double check on where you are. You find that government is an ever-changing mode of, of working with people. And you work with people so that you can get better. This is part of the process of getting better. The location was intentional, too, as McDonald Elementary School serves one of the larger concentrations of Huntsville's Hispanic and Latino populations. According to Principal Fraser Barnes, 6 to 8 percent of McDonald students are Hispanic or Latino. Over two-thirds of Alabama's Hispanic or Latino population lives in North Alabama. Specifically, 75.3 percent, or just over 78,000 people, who identified on the 2020 census as Hispanic or Latino live in these six counties in our region. Definitely we need more bilingual professionals to help. There's a lot more today than maybe five years ago, but it's not keeping up with the needs based on the growth of the community as it stands. The dialogue in English and Spanish was overwhelmingly positive, but the panel encouraged discussing challenges too, because this is an ongoing conversation as a community, no matter the language. In Huntsville, Simon Williams, Fox 54 News. Well, it's an exciting day for Calhoun Community College and Athens State University. The new Alabama Center for the Arts Residence Hall is now open. The living facility features 49 ADA compliant apartments that offer a mix of 11 studios. The residence hall also includes 19 one bedroom and 19 two bedroom units 
for a total of 68 beds. I have a very inconvenient food allergy, so the ability to have my own kitchen that is safe from cross contaminants means a whole lot to me. Sometimes students would come incredibly early and have to stay very late just to make school happen. I even had one student who could only come once a week and he had to take a taxi to make that happen. Wow, well it's also good to hear from that student. Each unit is equipped with a fridge, stove or oven, microwave, dishwasher and computer study labs on all three floors. Congratulations. <music> It's that time of year the kids are out of school and searching for just the right activities to get their hands on around the house. But no matter how old a child becomes, safety is always the number one concern. Tonight our Jasmine Bird has some gun safety tips for keeping the kiddos out of harm's way. We always encourage folks to be responsible with their firearms and take the necessary precautions to ensure that the firearms don't fall into hands that either cannot have them or are not prepared to have them. For bullet and barrel store manager Lewis Souther, there are various ways to do that, but one key way in particular. It's using a lockbox or even utilizing something like a cable lock, which we offer here at the store at no charge to anyone who may want one. The way they work is you unlock them and feed the cable through the action of the firearm and this will prevent it from being used uh, without in this case adult supervision. Huntsville Police Department responded to a shooting on Benford Drive Monday evening. Hempsey confirmed with Fox 54 that the incident involved a juvenile who suffered an accidental self-inflicted injury. The juvenile is said to have non-life-threatening injuries at this time. There's cases like that that are on the news, you know, and they're tragic. Southern says these cases can typically be avoided with one simple initiative. By simply locking your firearm up and, you know, always making sure it's unloaded when it's not in use. Kids are very smart nowadays and you know just relying on ammunition not being next to the gun or what have you is not going to replace locking the firearm up when it's not in use. In Huntsville, Jasmine Bird, Fox 54 News. Huntsville's craft beer scene is gaining traction, yet having a way to locally source what's needed can benefit both brewers and farmers. Research done through the Alabama Research and Development Advancement Fund might be the answer. Arkin McCoy explains. When the temperatures drop in Alabama, farming can take a hit. But new research has found one crop that could be the answer. We do see those really harsh winters sometimes, but with barley that they are able to um, sustain themselves. In 2021, Hudson Alpha Institute for Biotechnology, along with collaborators at Alabama A&M University and Auburn University, received a grant from the Alabama Research and Development Advancement Fund to help local farmers diversify their crop selection. So this crop is really neat in the fact that, you know, we are growing during the winter months. It is a uh, winter barley varieties that we've been testing. Thacker shares a little behind the science. The varieties that we've tested at Alabama A&M that we tested at Auburn, they had really good cold tolerance, really good frost tolerance. Because where those genetics originated from, that's what they're looking for for these farms. Which would be good from an economic standpoint. Because of its cold tolerance, so like the farms are able to diversify their profits and they are able to access those markets during a different time of the year where they might be in off season depending on what crop rotations that they have implemented on their farms. And the barley being locally sourced can also be a more eco-friendly solution for sourcing. Especially in Huntsville, they are now able to source their barley within a 50 mile to 100 mile radius, which is awesome from a sustainability aspect because you're not necessarily having to truck it near as far. And it's just really neat to be able to support local farms. Thacker also shares the long term benefits of this project. We've impacted a lot of different groups. Um, so not only are we impacting our local economy, not only are we impacting soil health on farms, but we're also impacting students and building the next generation of agriculturalists. So that's really important to us to make sure that we have that next generation of scientists, that next, next generation of farmers, so we can continue to feed the world. For Fox 54 News, I'm Kim McCoy. The city of Madison is part of the growth we now see in the Tennessee Valley. Mayor Paul Finley addressed the business community with an update, unpacking several projects in the works. Our Jasmine Bird tells us more about it. 
It's all about quality of life. And I hope today we spotlighted a little bit about what that looks like. Madison Mayor Paul Finley addressing the business community with an update, sharing several projects in the works in efforts to keep up with the city's continuous growth. Keeping up with that growth has been the toughest part. But a new interchange in the works just near town Madison is expected to make a difference. It's the full interchange. Folks from Huntsville can get into town Madison. Folks from Decatur can leave town Madison. But it's not only about town Madison, it's about the folks down Zert Road in Triana, down in that Huntsville area. And it's also Gate 7. It makes a big difference for this entire community. But boy, the 500 acres of town Madison just completely are exposed, open when the interchange comes. Expansion is also evident with Toyota Mazda announcing 350 new jobs coming to the area. As you have these organizations about every week talk about expansions or bringing folks here, we don't take it for granted, but it's almost happening every week. And that happens because nobody cares who gets the credit. Everybody's working hard to make this the best community it can. And that's where success is coming from right now. Mayor Finley says all in all, it's about managing the growth. The key is making sure we don't overburden the school system, but we also want economic development. So it is something that you kind of have to find a balance. Working with our city council, I think we've done a pretty darn good job, but we're going to continue to work hard on it. In Huntsville, Jasmine Bird, Fox 54 News. All right, well, if you ever spend time walking the trails of Montesano, your stroll on the mountain could be getting a whole lot easier with a new mountainside greenway. As our Jasmine Bird tells us, the new project is expected to provide a safer travel route for pedestrians and cyclists. And this would be a first step in connecting actually downtown all the way to Montesano State Park. Hallie Porter with the Land Trust of North Alabama says the project will be approximately 1.2 miles. This project is to pave a current trail that we have that is natural tread and offer a paved option for people to travel up Montesano. Porter says this will be the only greenway going up Montesano. It'll start here at the Bankhead uh, parking lot for the land trust and go up to what we call the hairpin turn right before the old road into Montesano State Park. While on my walk up Montesano, I asked the Huntsville resident who walks the trail regularly what she thought about the new addition. It's not a green way yet, but I come here probably four times a week to walk and I think it's beautiful. And I do not think we need another greenway here. I think it's going to disturb the animals that have already been disturbed and we don't need any more pavement in Huntsville. As she mentioned, the trail is not a greenway yet. The Land Trust is also currently raising funds to make this all a reality. We've already got, including a pledge from the city of Huntsville, they're gonna partner with us on this. So we've got almost 700,000 already raised and we need an additional 300,000. So that's what we're looking to get between now and the end of August. And if Land Trust meets the demand, here's when we might see the new greenway. And in 2025 is when we look to begin construction on the project and hopefully it'll take about a year to complete. In Huntsville, Jasmine Bird, Fox 54 News. Residents who live close to Redstone Arsenal can be a bit annoyed or even alarmed by the noise that comes from the installation. If you're new to the area, you might wonder what exactly you're hearing. Our Ken McCoy stopped by the Arsenal today to get some answers and has the story. If you hear this, this, or this, there's no need to worry. So Redstone Arsenal does a lot of research development testing uh, here on the Arsenal. Obviously, that's, that's what uh, the Arsenal exists to do on multiple fronts for multiple agencies, from the FBI, the ATF, to NASA and different agencies. So a lot of that involves uh, conducting operations that make a lot of noise in the local region. Redstone Arsenal is getting the word out on how to complain or inquire about the noise heard on the Arsenal. So there's a lot going on at the Arsenal. It's uh, just to be expected. I know it's disturbing, but it's actually good for the economy. It uh, shows the growth of the arsenal and growth of the region. But before we show you how to complain, let's understand what we are hearing. They'll hear explosions uh, that where we're doing uh, 
testing of demolitions and different types of, uh, of missiles and things that the arsenal has been known historically for doing for the last 70 years. Uh, and then there's also the uh, test fire engines of Blue Origin rocket engines and things that are going on here right now that uh, NASA is doing in, in support of going back to the moon. So when are these tests usually done? They're typically going to hear them between Mondays and Fridays. Uh, they increase throughout the day. Most likely it's going to be in towards the evening hours. If you're hearing something around dinner time, typically it's going to be a test engine result or a test of some, some type like that uh, with NASA. Uh, the explosions occur typically during the day and typically there's a series of them. It's uncommon. It's like a train. As pe people get used to the trains going by and they get used to the demo noises. So it's something out of the ordinary that typically gets reported. And to file a complaint. So they can contact our public affairs office uh, for any information about the noise. The public affairs office typically will put out on our Facebook and through social media what the planned uh, noise times are going to be when we're going to have planned experiments and different things going on. And then if there's any damage by any chance, then they would report to the legal office, installation legal office, and, and file their complaints that way. For Fox 54 News, I'm Kim McCoy. All right, well, new developments are on the rise in the city of Huntsville. Growth isn't stopping anytime soon. Our Jasmine Bird tells us about another new community development expected in West Huntsville in about a year. Let's have a listen. Can you all think of any new things that might be coming to Huntsville? Um, I don't know. Restaurants. <laughs> a new green space, that'd be great. Um, I don't know. I feel like a hotel too. A sports complex? Now we're headed closer in the right direction. Huntsville Parks and Recreation Director James Gossett tells us about a new recreation center in the works for the West Huntsville area. We'll start breaking ground a little bit later in the summer. We got about 27,000 square feet of building space. This new center will be comparable to the Mark Russell Recreation Center in Hampton Cove. There'll be community rooms there, there'll be some activity rooms. So and then we have two full size gyms. We'll have a uh, indoor pickleball courts there on one side and we'll have volleyball courts there also along with the basketball. The facility will raise the number of recreational and community centers to roughly 15 throughout the city. Most of the time for most people recreation is about some somewhat about convenience. Um, not a lot of times do people want to for everyday recreation needs drive you know 14 or 15 miles. And one interesting thing to note. And I think it's our first kind of our first Fourier or Fourier out west our first venture out west um, and with with a with a public recreation center. So we're looking forward to that. We're looking, you know, we're excited to see how the community responds to it. We think it'll be a, we really think it'll be a hit out there actually. In Huntsville, Jasmine Bird, Fox 54 News. Sounds very exciting. Thank you, Jasmine. The city of Huntsville is already making way for September to remember as well, announcing the 2024 Jazz in the Park concert series. The Rocket City will welcome jazz artists from around the world. Performances will be held every Sunday in September at Big Spring Park East. And get this, this year's series will feature back-to-back -back performances on Sunday, September 1st, and Monday, September 2nd, which is also Labor Day. People who are just starting out to people who are well-established, who have heard about the excellence of this event, the excellence of this city, and want to be a part of this event. We're not only bringing in these entertainers to entertain the public, we're also putting them in the classroom the Monday after each event to uh, mentor the kids. Right, pretty exciting as well. Well, the first night, September 1st, Joe Rosam, Jeff Bradshaw, and Joaquin Joyner will perform. For the full list, visit fox54.com. The festival is free to attend and all are welcome. Now, another hot zip code on Unzipped, sponsored by ValleyMLS.com. A 2023 census report ranked Limestone County as one of the fastest growing areas in Alabama, and the city of Athens is just a piece of that growth. Our Ken McCoy spoke with one local shop owner on how much the area has changed. He'll unzip the 35611. Today, we're unzipping the 35611, also known as Athens, Alabama. Located in Limestone County, the city is primarily located for transportation, recreational facilities, and educational centers that makes it one of the fastest growing areas in North Alabama. And residents won't have to travel too far to enjoy basic quality of life amenities. The Swan Creek Greenway, for example, offers hiking, a covered bridge, and access to an archery course. Historic downtown offers unique shopping and dining opportunities, while chain restaurants, stores, and trendy shops are located along US 72, 
US 31, and at the I-65 exit. But don't take my word for it. It's definitely thriving and it's a very exciting time because people look at this as a destination now. How are you? Meet Regina Crawford. You came back. Owner of Crawford Gifts in downtown Athens, who's celebrating 30 years of service to the community. Being in business for 30 years is a great accomplishment for anyone, but have loved serving our community downtown and watching things grow and change over the years. There's lots of events going on, which just adds to the excitement. We stay open late for different events. We have Fridays after five, we have car cruise-ins, and lots of other events at some of the restaurants too. So definitely wanna check it out. 30 years in business also affords you the opportunity of getting to know your community. All of our customers are very important to us and we've made friends, know their families now. And now that Athens is a great destination to bring your family to live here, we've made lots of new ones. It's always been the vision for downtown to be a vibrant downtown and recently we've added lots of new restaurants to the district which has made a huge impact because people can come and shop and they can also enjoy a great meal here in the downtown area. And the enjoyment is generational. I have two grandsons under the age of 10 that live here in Limestone County so they have a lot of opportunities with our Arts Council and lots of summer events happening downtown that they can participate in also. Uh, it's just a great place to live. So if you enjoy a vibrant downtown, great quality of life amenities, and intergenerational activities, then the 35611 is just for you. With your Unzipped, I'm Ken McCoy. I'm meteorologist Emily Owen with a word about weather wise. If you've ever wondered about how the weather works the way that it does, you'll want to watch my new digital only series, Emily Explains. I'll share the science behind the wonders that come along with all types of weather we experience in the Tennessee Valley as well as North America. Watch for new episodes of Emily Explains on Fox 54 Plus and Fox54.com. My name is Tyler McPherson. I am 33 years old and I am a production assistant here at Fox 54. I was diagnosed with testicular cancer, um, specifically stage three. I had gone to the hospital. I had felt a few growths on my right testicle. I went through ultrasounds, I had blood tests done. Ultimately, they said that I would need to have it removed to have a biopsy done, but it was very likely that it was cancerous. There were a lot of emotions that started going through my head. You know, what does this mean for my life going forward? Am I going to even survive this? I mean, you hear you hear the word cancer and immediately your mind just goes to the worst possible thing. What's the future gonna be like? What am I gonna have to go through? What kind of procedures am I gonna have to have done? So I was told that the survivability of testicular cancer is actually extremely high. Um, a, I think my survival chances were ba about 97%. Um, testicular cancer is one of the most treatable cancers out there. There's still a part of you that just is afraid. You hear news like this, you, even with all of the best medical care, with the odds in your favor, it still freaks you out. The person who was immediately available to support me was my husband, Chase. The moment Tyler was diagnosed, I felt a great sense of guilt because I hadn't given his concerns the respect they probably should have. I just didn't feel like a very good partner at that point. He stepped up. Chase actually made me a playlist of songs of encouragement. Bands like Circus Survive, Avril Lavigne, that he picked out to give me encouragement. Along with the music, I had uh, tabletop role-playing games to help me. During my treatments, Chase, once again, going the extra mile, uh, set up a lot of cameos 
from people that we both look up to. Just try to take care of the things you can control, you know, um, which is your own mental health and uh, your well-being. Tyler, I believe in you. Tyler, I believe in you. And I think you'll get well soon. You cannot lose hope. You cannot let go of faith. You must always stay encouraged. Your body may be weak, but your spirit can be strong. You just like handed all of this you have to deal with now. And I'm, I'm so happy that any of my songs can be a part of the peace in your life. I, I, I can't tell you the smile it put on my face. The cancer had gone uh, all the way up to my lungs. Thankfully, it only took the three cycles of chemo to take care of it six months later. All intents and purposes, I was in remission. There were no more tumor markers. My blood work looked good. I had gone to fill the car up. I looked out and I saw a rainbow. That was the moment that I knew I was gonna be okay. My mom, Sam, got a diagnosis of her own. She was diagnosed with endocrine cancer. We all agreed that she was going to fight this um, just as ferociously as I did. By December of 2022, we moved our way back up here, and she, she was well into her treatments at that point. It really hurt. It hurt me a lot because, um, you know, why did I get better? and? Why wasn't she? As of this May, it has been three years since that initial diagnosis. I moved back here. I started working here at Fox 54. I have an amazing partner. During all of my treatments, he commissioned a painting uh, that is currently hanging in uh, my den. He even managed to get uh, the singer of one of my favorite bands um, to perform a, a song for me. And every day that goes by, it really feels like I'm living up to that name. I consider myself a survivor. Yeah.